Welcome to NFL Daily, where the show's title kind of overrides the concept of Labor Day. I'm Greg Rosenthal, and pleased to be joined uh, by now a repeat guest. Hopefully we can make this as regular as possible. Ollie Connolly, who does great work over at the Read Optional on Substack. Him and John Ledyard do a great podcast there, uh, which they renamed, and that's gotten going for the year. Uh, you know him and love him. He was on the Mina Kimes show last week. Uh, welcome, Ali. Thank you for having me. This is a huge, huge week for the north of England. You have me doing NFL Daily, Oasis' is reform. There's just big news <laughs> popping off all over the place. And you took off the hat, which, like, <laughs> what, what were you doing hiding... Uh, this beautiful lettuce you got there, you know, forget the Kirk Cousins co- comps that, that you have because he, he can't rock that. Every single comment I see under anything I do, my <laughs> entire social media feed is, oh, you look like Kirk Cousins. So I'm trying to do everything possible to yes. move past the, the Kirk comps. Not a terrible comp. You, you pointed out last time, not an awful comp. It could be way worse. No, no. He, he He's a successful man, handsome man, nice family, nice guy. Uh, we spent a whole episode talking about him last time, which was which was fun and a coincidence because I didn't know quite how similar uh, you looked to him. This time, I thought it'd be fun, Ali, because I've spent so much time, certainly over the last month, but especially over the last week, like going through the league as a whole and predicting and season. And it's like, these games are here. We're, we're at these games and we really haven't gone through the matchups of week one and week one is a very different week in the NFL. You know this because these teams really do prepare for their week one game longer and more extensively than they really prepare for any other game until maybe the playoffs where you start getting ahead of time. And so, yes, we have our preview show coming up on Thursday. I'm really excited for that show every week. Steve Weiss and Patrick Claibon are going to be with me on that. But I thought we'd get a jump on it and look a little more just big picture into these matchups. We've had this long off season, Ollie, and talk about kind of, man, what are we looking forward to the most matchup wise, just like kind of opening up a, a box on Christmas week one, because to me, week one is still the, the best week. I don't know if you agree with me on that or or what ollie because you've you spent a, a long time you you've been covering uh soccer you know uh, now you're back to doing american football full-time so i'm excited about that yeah th- as excited as could be I, my favorite thing about week one is overreactions to week one is two bad teams play each other and you think one's mm. really good after one does really well but like you, you spend a whole off season. I'm the kind of person where as we go through all the drafts, all the free agent transactions, I can be critical of them in the moment. And then two weeks before the start season, I start talking myself into basically every single team having an appropriate plan, something that could work, some kind of change they've made that may make sense. And I look forward to within by week three, week four, immediately going, that was terrible. I was right the first go around. <laughs> Everything is ruined. Um, so week one is our first chance to find out kind of where these teams lie. All right, let's get into it. I might as well start. Why not? Um, mm-hmm. the, fir- the first thing I thought about, and, and again, we're just going to pick out instead of like games, just more concepts or matchups, part of the matchups. I'm going to talk about the, the Eagles running game. Like I, I just want to see that off the bat because I just think of the trajectory of Kellen Moore. I also wanted to hear your thoughts on this, uh, especially that a year ago, we were being sold this bill of goods that he's going to fix the Chargers running game. And they actually had a monster week one. So again, week one can be misleading. I think they were over 200 yards in that game. And, you know, they're doing the under center stuff in the outside zone. He's mixing it all up. It looked great. And then they end up having the worst running game in the league. Obviously, they were effective when he was in Dallas. But now he goes to a team in Philadelphia, which for all their troubles last year, and Jalen Hurts wasn't even... 100% for a good chunk of the season. I mean, they were the number five most efficient running game, according to DVOA. They were pretty effective the whole season. Obviously, Jason Kelsey's there. You, you have the tush push, but he's coming to a group and a you know, system that, that's been good. Now you add Saquon Barkley. The offensive line is different. You go against this Packers defense, which could be a, a whole nother conversation. Uh, but I have heard some reports Ollie from from Eagles training camp that they've had Hertz pretty involved in the running game, which I think they were encouraged by a little more running backs in the passing game, which they talk about every year. But that's exciting. So I just don't know what I'm going to get, because to me, they're one of the signature units of the entire NFL Eagles running game over the last couple of years. And now it's going to be different. Like, what are you looking for there? 
Yeah, I think the number one thing you hit up top is how involved is Hurts in this run game. When they were really rolling with Shane Steichen, that to me has been probably the, the best offense in the last four or five years. For what all the meta trends are on defense, how you would attack them all, is what Kellum, with, which is what Shane Steichen came up with, which was a power spread offense. All five guys can pull downhill running threat and then a really talented, accurate deep ball thrower. That is like the go-to way to kind of disrupt what everyone's doing with movement up front, movement on the back end. That's the way to get after it. Kellen Moore is someone I've been pretty critical of in the past because he, to me, is a guy who is only really interested in the payoff plays. He's not as involved in the down-to-down -down sequencing of how to get to those payoff plays. There is an awful lot of highlights, social media clips, great whiteboard stuff, as opposed <laughs> to maybe having a feeling and sense for like the rhythm of a game itself and how to dig out of a hole when things aren't going well, which is why I think you get moments where he has... 55 point explosions in Dallas because everything is just clicking mm. the way it was designed and he can't necessarily get himself out of a hole when it's not flowing the same way so for me he's walking into an organization where he should just ask them all for the playbook from two years ago hand it to me good stuff let's get rolling that's still the best way to approach this thing and it's just getting Jalen Hurt, Jalen Hurts the downhill runner as involved as possible okay so a few things there and I can't remember because one of my favorite um things you would hit on uh, on your podcast. And again, like if I can do one thing uh, today, it's it's to point people uh, towards the read optional Ali Substack. I, I, I've i been paying for this this podcast last year. And I do like the coordinators you get on for being too flashy, <laughs> that they, there's some that you think it's, it's kind of like a look at me coordinators versus having an overall smart scheme. I can't remember if Kellen Moore was in that category. Yeah, was he, he? he might be the poster child of it. Oh, he of, is. Of, the flashy, um, <laughs> I go viral, people write nice profiles about me because I do interesting or cool things that draw attention, but is it really helping the offense move? Is it efficient enough? And he's got some unbelievable numbers, though he has worked with incredible talent. The thing for me was he goes to the Chargers and everyone was saying, wow, this is going to be incredible, Justin Herbert with Kellen Moore. And once again, it becomes, look how clever Kellen Moore is rather than is this thing effective? Mm. And uh, yeah, again, we'll, we'll see what the difference of, of Jason Kelsey not being there. I think it's going to be a difference, but they, they've been ready for this moment with Cam Jurgens. Also, that game is on Friday night in Brazil. It's one of the best <laughs> NFC games of the season. Like it just, I can't believe this is all happening, but it's fantastic. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing a recap of that show. We're having Adam Lefko, who I'm a big fan of and is, is an Eagles uh, guy who's gonna is gonna join me after the show. So he's either going to be bummed out or happy. Why don't you you get me going with your first one, Ollie? My big thing is the state of the Ravens defense. Mm. You know, we just we don't have very much data on, you know, defensive football year to year fluctuates so much. It's so volatile. These kind of new breed of we sim a bunch, we roll a bunch on the back end. We just don't have much data on how those perform year to year. And so you have a first time coordinator who's not been coaching football for a long time with a team that relied so much last year on one guy in the middle of the field being an absolute monster and Kyle Hamilton being the most unique player in football on the back end and playing all three levels, going against the best staff in football, the best player in football um, in prime time. To me, it's the number one thing of, mm. I don't expect him to, you know, find a way to confuse and befuddle Patrick Mahomes, but it, it's, it's more finding out, is he just going to run the same system as Mike McDonald or does he have his own identity and imprint he wants to put on the team which may be more reliable, sustainable as the year goes along. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious too. I'll just pick that one next, which is what Mike McDonald's going to do. But sticking on the Ravens, you're right. It used to be a cliche. You do these shows long enough, you find yourself repeating yourself. And there, there was an Andy Reid week one thing going for a little while. I feel like that's calmed down a little bit. It definitely peaked in... Uh, the week one where Kareem Hunt just went crazy on, on the Patriots in Foxborough. But he would always come up with some stuff that you just hadn't seen before in week one. And Mike McDaniel does that too. And thinking about that versus uh, a brand new coordinator in Zach or I, I'm not as, I'm not worried about their defense, but yes, I'm, I'm curious how it's going to look. I'm excited to see what the secondary is going to be with Nate Wiggins. Like that's an interesting week one guy. I do just put some faith and maybe it's too much faith that Zach or is a great coaching prospect just because the Ravens chose him. They apparently had four defensive coordinators on their own staff last year and Mike McDonald left. And so they chose Zach Orr out of the other three. And so I guess I'm going to give it to John Harbaugh that he's going to make a, a smart choice, but it's hard to guess like exactly what that's going to look like. 
Yeah, I just think if your kind of predominant blue chip thing isn't that we have one or two top tier pass rushes, yeah, that to me is a thing that's sustainable. I, I look, I love the sim pressure world, all the dorky stuff. I get it. I just don't know how reliable it can be year to year. And look, you can't mm. teach Kyle Hamilton, you can't teach Roquan Smith. All those guys, Madab I think, will still be as good as he was last year. Well, they're year. still there, though. Mirage. They're not going anywhere. Everyone's still there. But I, I just don't know if you give people that long to take a look and review things. And you're coming in week one. You imagine he's going to default to the things that he thinks work best last year. And then over time, kind of blend in how he views the game, right? That's what I would assume would happen. Rather than trying to tear it up what was a great unit last year. And so they've had however long to prepare with the best player in football, with the best offensive mind in football. That's the thing for me. And it's one of those ones where it would not surprise me if it didn't look that great in week one and try not to overreact to it. But I do think it's something worth watching. Absolutely. And I, I think you point out in terms of the edge rushers, of course, Jadevian Clowney's not there after he had a good season. Odafe Owe has gotten a little better every year and certainly could have a good season. But after that, like they're starting Kyle Van Noy at... In the year 2024, I know Kyle Van Noy's played well for the most part the last few years, but that that's a thin edge group. Uh, absolutely. I do like the secondary. It's fun. So that, that's a good one to look forward to. I might as well go to my Mike McDonald one. It's not that deep, but it's just, you know, what, it, what does his defense look like without a Roquan Smith in Seattle? Because to me, their off-ball linebacker situation is, could be a total fiasco. I think there's some concern about people who have watched them uh, in training camp because Jerome Baker has not been healthy and Terrell Dodson, we'll see. Uh, he hasn't been 100% either. They actually traded for uh, a rookie who's going to be a backup at off-ball linebacker. And so what does that look like? Now, if you look at the preseason, which I guess does tell you something, they were the leader you know, in stunting in the preseason percentage-wise by a good amount and they were running a lot of sim pressure. So for as much as people say like the preseason doesn't tell you anything like Todd Bowles was the run one running the most blitzes. Uh, Mike <laughs> McDonald's the one running the most stunts. I mean, they kind of do what they do, even if it was in the preseason. And I, I think they have enough talent overall uh, to make it work. But I do love the matchup week one that they're going against Bo Nix and this hype machine in Denver that's a little out of control. And I have to stop myself from just pushing against the fans, because it's not Sean Payton or Bo Nix's fault that the fans <laughs> think Bo Nix is this awesome, but it does annoy me, Ali. Well, Mike McDonald has the chance here <laughs> to like win week one by closing down Bo Nix in a, a misbegotten hype train, and then people saying, look how smart Mike McDonald is, right. not being one of the great week one overreactions before they get their heads clubbed for the next five, six weeks. That's definitely in play. My big concern with Seattle, I, I think the linebacker stuff, the way Mike McDonald approaches things, they really play in a pretty limited plane. You're not asking an awful lot of people. It's pretty vertical and north-south. That There's not an mm. awful lot going on there for those guys. So that is something you can pick up with. I mean, he had great ones last year, and I understand that, and that is a true cheat code. The big thing for his defense is their nickel has to be, if not the best player on the unit, in the top three. And he's only not the best one because the two guys are such freakazoids. That's like the go-to thing for that defense, they blitz it so often it is crucial to the run scheme. I don't want to bore people too much with the details. I I love Devon Weatherspoon. I thought he was the best corner in that class. I'm not sure for that role where a big part of the responsibility is being a wall defender versus the run. This is a guy who hits, who comes down, who flies around, but he doesn't scream out to me as a guy who can like mm. drive someone off the ball, plant and shift a blocker. It is more driving downfield and clotheslining someone and trying to create a turnover. So that to me is the concern that they've got a lot of talent on the back end, I think, because of the young guys. I'm not sure they're necessarily aligned to what he wants to do, which then means he might have to switch things up and put more pressure on the linebacking group if he can't figure it out with the, the secondary. So I just don't know if we're going to get the, the pure uncut McDonald's right away. I think we're going to okay. be at least a year away from it. Because Devin Weatherspoon in that defense, you know, just from a basics point of view, it's like, oh, wow, is he a sneaky... Defensive player of the year candidate or an all pro candidate. And I am buying, there are some preseason stories I buy. And cornerbacks are so up and down that I am buying like the Reek Woolen rejuvenation because he understood what went wrong on some level last year that he'll be at least a, a quality corner. All it took for me, Ollie, were 
like a few reps where he embarrassed Calvin Ridley in joint practices and, and a few podcasts from Sha, uh, Michael Sean Dugar, who does a great <laughs> job of just saying he's looked awesome. And so I'm into that. There, there's a lot of talent and I think way more talent than the Broncos offense. And so that's one week one game. I'm just curious to see, I guess, if I'm right and if they can dominate uh, in that game. All right, you give me one more and we'll take a break after that. Uh, it's got to be Caleb versus the Tennessee defense. Is, t- is this Titan defense going to be good? Do you think they could be sneaky good? <laughs> I'm, I would tend to know. That's what I'm I'm going towards. It's a weird one because as I go through them, it does feel like, I don't know, me playing Madden and like the signing guys I've heard of in two years' time. So I understand that. But once you look at the secondary in particular, I do think there's actually a decent amount of talent there. And obviously the Bears receiving core is, it could be really overwhelming. Caleb is such an unusual player and, and can extend and create plays. And I get the concerns with the front seven. I love the Ernst Jones pickup. I think that can that can have an impact and they may not be a top 12 in DVOA type defense, but I don't think this is anywhere near like a troubling dumpster fire type unit. So I'm interested to see what that looks like in week one. Yeah. And it's, it's the same coaching tree. Denard Wilson. We, you know, we don't know if he's going to run everything the same. Actually, the way he's talked in the preseason does not sound like he's like running a a Mike McDonald type of defense. It's going to be a different, a different scheme. He he's his own guy. I mean, the front could be good. Tavondre sweat, Again, it's camp. I, I just think he's had a very positive camp, a, a guy that everyone was down on and, and certainly a lack of judgment with the DUI and his weight and everything. And yet everyone that's been at Titans camp is like, uh, he, other than Jeffrey Simmons, he's been our most consistent defensive lineman and he's actually shown up and, and it's translated and they could be good up front. And I'm a, I am a little worried about the Bears offensive line in general, I, I think Bears fans are higher on it that, than I am. But is that a matchup that they could lose week one, Caleb Williams? That's spicy. I could I could see them being good. I didn't love the Awuzie signings. Like, and he hasn't been healthy in camp. I didn't even love, love the Lodarius Sneed outside of Kansas City, not always being able to practice because his knee is such a problem signing. So that that's a big mystery box, a big question mark. But you're right. There's a chance there that they could improve quite a bit. Yeah, I think I'm higher on the secondary than you. I really like the safety room. I think they can do interesting, creative things with those guys. I, I think Sneed's really good. We'll see if you just put him in a pure bump and run situation and say you've got nothing else to do with the rest of the game. It That should translate. There's no earthly reason why it shouldn't. Yet for some reason, this happens every year in free agency. These guys don't translate playing the exact same technique as somewhere else. And for some reason, it doesn't work. Um, the front, I'm probably more down on from you. I'm, I'm not a Devondre Sweat guy. That is... To me, that's camp stuff. It's believe it when I see it. It's believe it when it's eight straight weeks and it's okay. snap to snap and it's not rotating off and just playing running downs and maybe possibly considering being in shape to play football um, at this <laughs> level. So that that is something I will I will definitely have to see before I believe it. And that's a great point, too, because, of course, in camp, like they're not, you know, they're in pads plenty but they're not they're not tackling to the ground they're doing it, it's a totally different sport and they're very thin there that I, I have sort of picked up on that like they're planning on him playing a lot he's certainly starting and that's that's a little concerning but if you get close to prime Jeffrey Simmons and it sounds like he's ready to go and Harold Landry finished out last season well and I think could have you know a is a certainly a solid edge like they they have guys uh, Arden Key had that suspension overturn. And so um, that's a fun one. Titans, Bears, week one. We're going to come back with uh, a couple more things that we're just like, we just can't wait to unwrap week one. We couldn't even wait to do uh, the preview show. So we'll be back in a couple minutes. All right, we are back here. On NFL Daily, and yeah, the, the big news in the UK, Oasis, it's back. They're back. Are you, What do you, what's your Oasis uh, connection? I'll, I'll give you a second to think about that as I say. My biggest connection there is the first ever weekend of my life that I ever just got drunk for an entire weekend <laughs> because I was either a freshman or a sophomore in high school, and someone someone had a house that was just open for the weekend. And I somehow, you know, got, you know, my parents allowed me to sleep over there. And I think I spent, we spent like two or three nights. Um, And yeah, that was, that was, that ages me a little bit. Um, uh, But it was definitely maybe an oasis uh, live forever, just basically on (laughs) repeat, like while getting drunk as a 15 year old for 48 hours straight. 
Well, I live in Manchester, England, as you know. I'm from the north of England. People can't tell that from my messed up voice of living in Boston for three years and having the world's mm. worst accent. Um, so for us, you know, 13 years old in a park with rock and roll star, believing and walking and talking like we are all Liam and Noel Gallagher. That mm. is how I was born and raised. That is awesome. I can I can kind of picture it, but not picture because I've never been to Manchester. When when I go, uh, it's like I always stay in London. This year, I really on Saturday want to, because Saturday usually I have some free time, want to like get outside the, the city. Not that London's not amazing, but it's time for me to venture out. Maybe you can help me with that, Ollie. Um, before that, though, let's talk uh, more week one and hmm, where do I go next? Let's go Col Colts defensive line. I had a lot Layatu Latu was just such a fun prospect to me, as fun of a edge prospect as there's been in, in a couple of years. And in the preseason, the little that we saw, he looked like the same guy in college. It makes you feel a little better that, okay, this is going to translate. And then you think about that defensive line in general. Uh, you know, the question for me is DeForest Buckner and Grover Stewart going to be close to where they, they have been at their peak? Because if they're anywhere close, and, and they've been pretty good lately, Next to Latu, and uh, you know you have Quiddy Pay as the other edge. That matchup against the Texans, Week One, you got Larry. You know maybe it's Latu versus Tunsil, which is like you know film geek porn there, <laughs> and the whole line in general. I have some questions about the rest of the Texans' offensive line, but that line and uh, some good linebackers for the Colts too against this explosive Texans offense and there's some familiarity now between the two coaching staffs to me that that's a really exciting week one of just like okay where are these these two sides at especially Latu versus Tunsil could be a lot of fun yeah that's a juicy one I I wish I really like that line I don't mind them playing a four down and go situation they've got the dudes they can just fire off the ball and make some hay I do kind of wish he was with someone other than Gus Bradley not to dump on Gus Bradley particularly but you just went through it, right? You've, we've got this guy, this pass rusher, who is an unusual type play. He doesn't win in normal ways pass rushers play football. I've described him before as like an MMA fighter. They just like let loose on the football field. It's mm. all weird hand movement and uncoordinated body stuff. It's not really fire off the ball and dip around the edge or run through someone's uh, chest. I mean, he can do that stuff, but he's at his best kind of levitating in the air and doing unorthodox kind of TJ Watt type things. So you look at the Texans line, you say, let's just plant this guy over the center, let him loose, and we'll we'll get like 10, 15 pressures. Everyone else can come screaming home. We all high five. What a great day. There's no need for him to be caught up in the Laramie Tunsil uh, <laughs> hurricane of just the, the speed and the power. And a guy who is who will be laughing if you try and hit him with some weird like Bruce Lee moves and then you just wind up in his arms, it's not mm. going to work. So that's not a great matchup, I think, for a lot of week one if he's going to come and try and do his typical things, which I think can make him a really, really good player in the league, I would like to see him moved around. And maybe Gus Bradley spent, you know, uh, six months away, hanging out in the lake, getting a bit frisky and deciding to change up things a little bit up front. It is kind of wild to think about the run that Gus Bradley's had. I don't know if he's had a single season where he hasn't run a defense since he started running a defense. And yeah, he, he has the reputation. You can tell me if it's, changed in your eye in any recent years of yeah he's gonna line him up he's gonna have the four linemen he's gonna do what he does I mean he's mixed it a little bit on the back end maybe before but he's a little more static and a little more just like our players are gonna beat your players more than yeah. most coordinators it, it's really static and it's all about which is fair enough the NFL it's really hard you got guys rolling in and now injured right practice squad guys it, it makes a ton of sense to say you get me players I'll teach them technique we'll go win games it is still for all the fun stuff about rotations and, and sim pressures, it is still 60-40, uh, uh, man coverage, single high lead. That's what it is. So that's what he majored in. Him getting frisky was adding in a dose of Tampa 2 and being like, hey, look at me, guys. Kind of, kind of getting, <laughs> right. getting out there over here. Look at me. So I don't think it's going to be a, oh, a wacky uh, situation on the back end, but he's now been given these pieces where he could do interesting things to them. It could be more... Niners like where it's at least an overload front and we're trying to do something a little bit different to get after people in the pass rush game because he's now he's got the pieces there's not really an excuse I don't think for them to be one of the best pressure teams in the league yeah uh Deo uh, Adigbo is still there Samson Abacom just a little update I had mentioned he was out for the season we believe with an Achilles there they put him on designated re to return 
There was a Terrell Suggs Achilles tear once where he returned by the end of the season. So if they're, they're you know, I think they can be a playoff team. I put them in the playoffs uh, in our AFC preview with Nick Wright as one of the wild card teams. So just something to keep an eye on that that maybe he could return. But they're fairly deep, especially on the edge. They have Taekwon Lewis. It's a it's a fun defense. It's a fun off. I mean, it's just a fun division. Uh, why don't you go with the next one? For me, it has to be the Dallas defense. I have no idea what this thing is going to be. We get Zimmer back. I don't think people quite understand last year how corrupted they were by design for long stretches because Dan Quinn is considered a great coach. He had the two really good years and he gets a head coaching job. So he gets a job promotion, which I think people think means he did a great job. But structurally, they were a disaster for like large chunks of last year. And I've made this point before where it just because you had that one bad year doesn't mean Dan Quinn can't be a good head coach elsewhere. That could be what happened in a job interview, can run a program, has done the job before. But if he just went in without any of the background stuff and it was just a tape by tape who had a good year the year before, there is no mm. chance he's getting any kind of job. And so you bring Zimmer in and they do absolutely nothing. They get Eric Kendricks, who is just like scotch tape together as please give us a chance. They say they're not going to run all the three safety stuff. They're betting on Marzi Smith and these guys to show internal development. They lose a cornerback. I, I, I'm i pretty worried that they're not going to be anywhere near the level people would assume they would be. The thing they've got going in their favor is I'm also not quite sure about Sean Watson, the Cleveland Browns offense. And we may get one week where where Micah Parsons sparkles and, and we still think that they're a really effective group. That That's really interesting. And I haven't heard it put that way. I think you're right because of the presence of Parsons and just the name of Lawrence. Although Demarcus Lawrence is still a good player. He's, he's not what he was, but he's, he's still a plus player to have out there. Um, not as Not as much talent. And you're right. I didn't think Dan Quinn had that bad of a year. I thought he had a bad, like, final six weeks. It was kind of disastrous. It reminded me a little bit of Mike Rabel uh, getting the promotion to a head coaching job, too, when his defense was absolutely terrible. <laughs> in, in it, it's not a bad year. If you go by some of the, the metrics and the measurables, it's not so bad. I'm just saying that if you are someone who's evaluating a coaching job and you sit down with them and say, walk me through what you're doing here, they have things where, run fit-wise, they don't make any logical sense, and it was happening weekly, and you've got you know, they're playing more defensive backs than anyone else in the league. They got defensive backs fitting B gaps, which regularly, which is not like cool Brandon Staley stuff. It's like an error. Then they have a bunch <laughs> of plays when it's run to the perimeter where two guys are arriving in the same spot at once. So that's just either a coaching issue of feeding it into the players, or you've designed a poor defense and you don't know how to spin your way out, out of it midway through the year because you realize we don't have any linebackers. What have we done? And their well, answer Zim to this is to go and get Zimmer and Eric Kendricks. That's the solution. <laughs> yeah, the Kendricks hype, and I think I've said this on this show, so I feel bad uh, piling on, but this weird thing where I'll listen to Cowboys analysts and it's like, well, we got you know, we fixed linebacker by getting Eric Kendricks. I was like, no, Eric <laughs> Kendricks was a, a problem for their last two teams. He's, he's going to be a problem for your team. Zimmer coming off the shelf, you never know. Like, could he get a little wild or could it be stale? Like, he's a bit of a mystery. Certainly one of the you know, most effective defensive coordinators of the last 20 years. And yet, yeah, diff different situation. So, so Everyone's on the hot seat. It's weird. He certainly is. And everyone loves Mike Zimmer. I love Mike Zimmer. I, I love the tenor and tone of how he just views football. I love the curmudgeonly style when it's kind of this like little genius hidden in there, but he's a curmudgeon. He's so That's good on hard knocks as a D <laughs> coordinator. It was so good with, with the Bengals. It was fun. That is my favorite kind of coach. But I think he's a little bit misunderstood in the sense that they were never that wacky or inventive. They did some interesting things with Harrison Smith and it was like, well, therefore the whole defense must be really, you know, inventive and cool. He's very static. It's very cover three. It's pretty traditional. It's three linebackers as often as possible. That's why they went and got Kendricks. It's like you wouldn't mm. have made that move if that was not the style you were expecting to run again. And Dan Quinn, to be fair to him, really overhauled the entire thing, became a guy who was playing a bunch too deep and rotating a lot. It just failed. It was just not well designed by by the end of the run there and was bailed out by great players up front, essentially masquerading, you know, covering up a lot of like technical flaws with the defense. I think Zimmer can at least fix those bare basics. And that is a, a starting point. I just don't know if they have that much talent. Yeah, they're counting on Damone Clark, maybe. And who knows? He might be the fourth linebacker, but they, they think maybe he develops uh, DeMar Vian, uh, Overshawn, maybe improving. That's a, a third round pick from a year ago development there. 
I've heard there's some concerns about Marshawn Nealon and his hip coming into the ceiling. I know, I know he's a defensive end, but they're, they're a little thinner and you're right. Just the talent isn't quite as good. And certainly Deron Bland's injury doesn't help there. I, I hate to go so Cowboys heavy and be basic, but that was my fourth was the offense. So I guess I got to watch this game. I really am interested in this game. Plus it's Brady's first game. I, I have to admit as a broadcast head and a Brady head, you know, just all of it. I'm, this is the, this is my main game. I'm, I'm in Fox. I'm not going to be like a hipster. I want to watch this game, but it, it is because of the offense for the Cowboys to me more than the defense that this offensive line versus the Browns defensive line. Now they've had some injuries in camp, but you know, Miles Garrett potentially against Guyton and, or whoever they're, you know, going to have it right tackle there. Um, it, it was a really effective defensive line. I'm wondering if this Browns defense, kind of like you mentioned uh, with Mac, you know, Mike McDonald's defense and, and everyone getting a year to kind of get used to the scheme and everything. What is, Year two, Jim Schwartz in Cleveland, can it be as effective? And then all the questions that we have about the Cowboys offense, specifically to me, the offensive line coming into the year and the running game. And I'm just, I don't really have a hot take of like how it's going to go. I just want to see it and what the heck happens. The Browns one is fascinating because that's one where we'll know, I think, within like a quarter, like is the magic still there? They, they last year played like almost a high school kind of defense. It was 72% of the time the middle of the field is closed. They ran basically three coverages all year. They had like four changeups. That was the entire defense. And then they've got this outrageous pass rush, which is just players. It was just four down and go. And that is great coaching. It's like, I have really good players. I'm going to put them in the best spot. We'll play man coverage everywhere. It's really easy. They had really talented corners. But when you're losing guys to injury to just say, this is what Belichick always did so well, why he'd always just find a cornerback. People go, how does he do that? Belichick's such a genius. He says, you find that guy and you run with him everywhere. That's the job for the week. We're not doing all cool, creative coverage stuff. So I think we'll know pretty quickly whether they still have that kind of talent. I just don't know if it's easy to roll with that year on year and say we're going to be the most static, predictable defense league and not just, you know, do well, but house people by a big distance in terms of pressure, sacks, TFLs, all that kind of stuff. So I think we'll know quickly. And then for Dallas, I, I just don't trust that staff to ever make things easy. It's like they, as good as Dak is, and I'm a huge Dak believer, it's like they they think there's some kind of like extra bonus points for it being very complicated. Mm. And that's how they view offensive football. And there just isn't. And if he's not got the time and he can't create to move as well as he has it in the past, then I think they could be in trouble. Yeah, and it could be one of those matchup-based things that both of these units are a little worse than everyone thinks, but it's a fun game. It's close. It's the national game, and you feel good maybe about both sides coming out of it. It's like, oh, that was a good match between two good sides, and maybe not because, to me, Cook Brandon Cooks is is not what he was. He hasn't been what he was, and we'll see. They, they've been high on, on their third receiver. Um, who am I? Th- I'm th- wanting to say Guyton, but Jalen Tolbert, not Jalen Guyton, uh, who's had a good camp and everything. Ferguson's a solid to, you know, but this is a maybe a group you can cover uh, with man coverage other than C.D. Lamb, who, who's not going to have a ton of practice time before this game. All right, let's wrap up one more. Pick your best one you got remaining, Ali Connolly. Uh, best one I got remaining is Bryce Young. Has to be Bryce Young. What on okay. earth is this thing going to look like? Do you have any idea of what Bryce Young will look like in year two? Because for me, the big thing is it's like everyone's already moved on. C.J. Stroud is great. We get Caleb Williams. We get Drake May. And it's as though everyone outside of Carolina is like the number one overall pick who they traded their entire franchise to go get might just stink. And they don't want to say it publicly. Uh, And I hope he's going to be great. The league will be awesome if Bryce Young is amazing. That would be Mm. lovely. Um, I just, from what they've said, what they've messaged, what they've shown in the tiny sample size possible, I'm just not buying and believing it right now. In terms of the camp, progress and you know he had one good preseason drive but it's hard to take too much out of that I just feel like and you can tell me what you think about Canales that it'll make it should make more sense I I just am more concerned that even if he plays better the talent around him is the coaching enough to like what's what's the upside here? Like it's the ceiling's still probably pretty low. Even if he plays better, I keep comping him to Alex Smith, just in terms of like 
where he could go as one of the worst rookie quarterbacks of all time to a pretty respectable second year under Norv Turner with the 49ers, where I was like, okay, this guy's going to have a career and, and be a decent enough starter. That's that's probably the hope, but I still think everything around him is pr- probably close to bottom five level. Yeah, I mean, the offensive line, they did improve, and it was such a disaster last year, but it's one of those ones where they invested so much money in it. It's like, even if it's just like bad... Right, or maybe. Is average, Damian Lewis and Robert Hunt like... How many people were talking about them as difference makers last year? I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I think it's not going to be great. Uh, the only thing you can buy, it's like trying to give Bryce Young his second contract now by buying other players in the hopes he may be good and then you can make a decision. But at some point, you you would have to pay him then at that point. Uh, so it's, I, I think it's a gutsy strategy to basically make yourself bad on defense. We will be old and bad on defense to give this guy a hope is to their credit of trying to find out what they got with this guy. I just don't like the pairing of the coach of the quarterback. I think mm. it will work to a point of Canales is a really good motivator, confidence builder. I view him as more of like a glorified quarterback coach who's also the head coach. Where I get concerned from what he's been messaging and what they've shown so far is that he will have a hands-on role in the actual offense. That gives me a uh, cause to pause and concern. I just don't think that fits with Bryce Young, the player, at all. Um so even if you can build it slightly, I think we're going to end up with the season where it's like Bryce Young's maybe there's something in there and that isn't really a good answer either. You kind of just want to know, right, by the end of the year, either this isn't going to work, we've got to pull the rip corn and find a way out because we've got to build the rest of our roster. We've sunk so much money into the offensive line now. We're going to have to make some tough decisions or, yep, we got it. There's a ch- pathway to stardom here and we can start building around that. And I think what they're building here for some strange reason, in my opinion, is some part, some kind of Jared Goffian, uh, Baker Mayfieldian, Russell Wilsonian type offense that just is not a fit for Bryce Young, the player based on the. Why not? Set. Like why not? So and you you said Canales being so involved in running the offense is almost a red flag for you. Their offensive coordinator is Brad Idzik. Just the name Idzik freaks me out. It's sort of like the opposite of. Um, you know, Nepo baby, but I guess it worked out for him that like he overcame what happened with his dad with the Jets. But uh, wh- why don't you think Canales and Young fit perfectly together? Yeah. And if you go through the rest of the staff, these are all his boys from Seattle. He just went through the phone book. He brought all his boys with him in Seattle. They didn't go and bring out someone as an outside hire who maybe would blend more with a, a true spread type style that Bryce Young I think would be best. And now I've said this in a bunch of places. So I'm sorry if people heard this before, but he's such an unusual player to try and build a typical offense that constrains the quarterback Mm. that is Jared Goffian when he doesn't have those skills makes no sense. And it sounds like I've been smoking a bunch of weed or something to say, you've got to build something no one's ever seen before, man. It's got to look completely different, man. (laughs) But I think that's true. I think you need, this is, we've never seen someone with that skill set whose best trait is tap dancing in the backfield, right? That's the number one Bryce Young thing. Can he create and play make from the backfield? So in a Drew Brees body. That's who, that's who he is. So you, what you have to do is give him as many options as possible on every single play. You know, constraining him in a two-man route combination offense where it's you hit the deep cross or you check it down, he's just not that player. He doesn't mm. drive the ball down the field like Russell Wilson. He doesn't drive the ball down the field like Jared Goff. These guys where it's a point and shoot, take that and go. That's not who he is. And that's the style they've been running in the preseason. It's a whole bunch of concept v coverage if the concept wins get rid of the ball so you're trying to make him baker mayfield by limiting him as much as possible that's what they're trying to do when the point of taking the guy would be he can create for us and you can only create if there are as many options out in the route as possible so that he can move around bounce and then go find people downfield maybe like a i'm trying to think well what would be good for him and you're right i I saw yeah i think people underrate or have forgotten about his you know, potential creativity. He, he didn't have the confidence to, to necessarily do it. Certainly he can throw with anticipation. Uh, and he showed a little bit of that in that preseason, just the way he was moving looked good. It was like, okay, this guy's in the NFL. He, he realized that I'm trying to think what would be good for him. It's like a, like a Deshaun Watson in Houston type of thing. I don't know. Even, even, even that, I mean, <laughs> that, that was, again, Deshaun drives the ball down the field. It's really, yeah. it's difficult to play in an offense where you're basically in, in a three man situation. That's a lot of what they do. These like levels concepts, you call them deep, intermediate, short. That's a lot of what those offenses are when your guy can't truly really drive it down the field. It has to be a lot of what the Rams have done when they get into empty is it's an right, awful exactly. lot of double stack switch releases 
and then you can just throw it up and someone runs underneath it. That's what you would need. Now, I think they should be at 10, 15, 12% in empty and just have us on a podcast, people writing deep features. How are the Panthers running empty at by far the highest rate since Brady was really cooking in, in 2011? That's what it should be. Right, but that's where I threw out Watson because if I'm right, I, I think there was a lot. Of, I was just trying to think who can be a, a point guard and just create and options and they will be fun. That's a fun one uh, to watch in week one. They're they're playing the Saints. I do like week one games where it feels as close to a must win as possible. So on one hand, like Saints Panthers is low on everyone's list of probably what they're watching first, and yet if that game is fifteen to twelve. In the fourth quarter, Panthers are leading the Saints, and that crowd is booing Derek Carr a little <laughs> bit and grumbling. There actually feels like there'd be more stakes in that game because the Saints can't lose that game to start the season than almost any other NFL game out there. So that's fun to me. Every game in week one is a little fun in, in different ways. Uh, it was great having you, Ollie. Again, if I, if I can do anything, li- listen to this podcast that... Ollie does with John Ledyard and Ollie does a great job writing too. You can get smarter. And so that's over at the read optional podcast. And and we hope to have Ollie on throughout the course of the season Uh, until Tuesday. Look, I'm going to have Jordan Rodriguez back. And uh, before the season starts, we're going to choose what what would be our ideal roster, almost like a preseason all pro team, but in the 53 man roster form, it's going to be a fun exercise. Uh, Until then, uh, football's back.